Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Cristiano Amon, CEO of Qualcomm. Cristiano, nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Andy. So let's start off with AI, of course. And I'm curious, how does Qualcomm play in AI? Yes, look, it's really awesome what's happening with AI right now. The way uh, things are developing, and you look what happened with uh, what they call large models like ChatGPT, and the rate of progress, you know, you can imagine that just within a year from now, there will be a number of different use cases. And, you know, I like to think about um, a co-pilot of everything, like on every application. It's interesting for us, we see this as an incredible opportunity. The way to think about this is AI will require from a chip standpoint, from a semiconductor standpoint, accelerated computing. And uh, if that becomes pervasive, you're gonna have to run that on many of your uh, devices. It's not only gonna be unique to the cloud. And I think that's the opportunity for Qualcomm. And when we look where we're present today, we see this opportunity for AI to touch each and every one of our business. For example, let's start with the phone side. We demonstrated, it was uh, in Mobile World Congress 2023, uh, we demonstrated uh, running Stable Diffusion, which is a model that creates text to image in a phone. It was over one billion parameter in a phone. And now we see a lot of OEMs interested in how, for example, you think about things that you do in your phone and you share pictures with each other, you can take a picture and you can say, I want to change the landscape, I want to be in Tibet or something like that, text to image, that changes. And that's just some easy examples. Um, the interesting thing is what we're doing also in with Microsoft as we enter the PC space. Um, this whole concept that Microsoft is driving about a co-pilot for each of their enterprise applications. You can run those things locally in the device. So as we enter the PC space for next generation laptops, that is an opportunity for AI accelerated computing. And the one that I'm most excited about is what's happening with our automotive business. Um, you know, I like to think about when I was uh, uh, a teenager, I used to watch Knight Rider. Think about something like a, a large language model, like a ChatGPT, built into your car, and you can just talk to your car. And uh, natural language is a great interface when you're behind the wheel. So it's exciting opportunity for AI, and uh, we're looking forward to ride that wave. I want to drill down on each one of those areas you just touched on. But first, uh, Cristiano, I'm curious, when you talk about um, AI empowerment on local devices versus the cloud, so, so that's what you mean and that would boost your business because your chips would be able to enable the use of AI locally rather than the cloud, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Maybe to get a little bit technical, but not too much. So when you look at some of those large language models, let's think, for example, the ChatGPT uh, tree that has over 200 billion parameters. And uh, for every word, we call it a token, you run that model, you get one word, you run the model, get another word. And that's why when, when you're chatting, you see the words coming up like that. Uh, the reality is you can shrink some of those models down if they are well trained from like say a 200 billion parameter to let's say in the order of 20 billion parameter. When that happens, you now create an opportunity even to run uh, those models into the devices. And there's a lot of benefits when you run that in a device. I think one is you have the ability to significantly save costs. Just think of that for a second. I'm just, I like to provide this example. If search, which you now there's this competition about what's the future of search look like. So you search something, you get a number of links. Now think about in every search, you start chatting with all of the different search results because you could go in yourself and check it, but you start chatting, here's what I want. So if that gets, a sign as a behavior for every single search, you have to uh, build capacity in the data centers, which are gonna grow exponentially. You know, you, we may have an argument whether it's gonna be six times, eight times, 10 times, but definitely more than three, just to put in perspective. So if you have the ability to have well-trained models that you can run on a device, all of a sudden, and you have this concept, which is hybrid AI, you can run on a device or you can 
start on the device and give the large model and the cloud a head start. I think that alone creates a completely different economic equation. But I, but you shouldn't just think about that as the only way mm -hmm. why you should do uh, the device level AI. The other thing is latency. Mm -hmm. uh, certain tasks, you need a response right away. Uh, you cannot wait. And I think there's things that are their unique context about what you've seen at the moment. If you look at a co-pilot of things, let's say, for example, you go to a web page and you want a co-pilot of your browser to summarize that web page for you based on what's important for you. That needs to be fast. If it's not fast, you just read the web page. So there's there's unique things which require you to have latency. The last part of it is privacy. Um, an enterprise, for example, one of the things when ChatGPT became available and all those other models became available, we put a policy in that our engineers couldn't send source code to ChatGPT to ask them to uh, verify the code because then it's gone. So you may, for certain applications, you wanted to, the data to be locally. I, you know, I like, there's so many ideas mm -hmm. right now, Andy, about right. uh, those large language models across many industries, and it's just a big opportunity. Yeah, when you said pilot, I was thinking about autonomous vehicles or on an aircraft, you obviously want computing power on the device, on the vehicle, rather than waiting for something to come back and forth. So um, interesting stuff there. You are an engineer by training, and I'd love it if you could sort of just give us uh, the layout of Qualcomm today. You did that a little bit, but talk to us about the various business unions. You've been known as a company that makes chips and chipsets for phones, but I know, and I know that still exists, but you're moving beyond that as well. That's good, it's a great question. Look, the, the way I like to describe Qualcomm, the elevator pitch on Qualcomm, what are our assets? I think uh, we have three major pillar of uh, assets in the company. One is everything wireless connectivity. We have always been the number one company in cellular. We also the number one in Wi-Fi. Most people don't know about this. Um, the second pillar is high performance computing for battery power devices. And the pillar number three is on device artificial intelligence. So what we realize, Andy, is the technology that we were doing for phones, and we have been and still are one of the most focused uh, mobile companies, could find end markets in many different uh, industries when you put those three pillars together, connectivity, computing, and intelligence. So as such, we we started to diversify the company. One of the things I'm doing since I became CEO is accelerate that process. So then we're going from phones to PCs to uh, virtual reality, augmented reality glasses, when you think about merging of physical digital spaces, to the automotive, uh, to uh, you know enterprise networking, and into the broader industrial IoT. So we have a number of opportunities we're pursuing. I think we're we're happy with the rate of progress. I think it's now uh, close to 30% of our revenue is from those uh, new markets, and uh, we're going to continue to be on this journey. So demand for phones, though, Christiana, has been sluggish, yes. and that has dragged down the revenue forecasts for the company Absolutely. last month. Where do things stand right now with phone demand and revenue, et cetera? Yes. So phone... You know, it is it is the largest consumer electronics market. It's a big market. But phones, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, have been in decline. So, you know, if you think about before the pandemic, the size of the market was close to about 1.4 billion phones a year. It's now down to about 1.1. Still big. Annual sales of units. Annual sales of units. So, so the total market's still big, but it's not growing. And I think uh, phone is a very good indicator of economic activity. If consumer confidence is low, you postpone the upgrade of your phone. And I think the macroeconomics uh, really impacted the market. However, how we look at the projection of the phone business, um, and we, you know, we're not comfortable. And I think the last earnings call to call the bottom yet. But you know, we we're seeing maybe it's a couple quarters, maybe more. There are two other factors impacting phone uh, besides the macroeconomic. One factor is if you remember, we had about a two years of a chip shortage. And during the chip shortage, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of pent-up demand. 
as soon as the supply ease up, most companies build a lot of inventory. So you have this inventory that it needs to work yourself to the channel. The other factor is China. So China fully reopened, but we have not yet seen the numbers of China consumption. It's still, still somewhat suppressed. So eventually when China goes back to its normal market size, as well as this inventory correct, I think we're gonna know what the normalized size of the phone market is. And we're just navigating uh, to those sectors right now. Are the phone manufacturers sort of a victim of their own success in that they make such great devices you don't need to upgrade it? <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's interesting. I think it's a very cyclical business. So he has, different things that cause uh, upgrade cycle. I think we saw, for example, one of the biggest transition in cell phones was from feature phone to smartphones. You know, everybody want to get a smartphone. Then you have some other transitions like larger screens, 4G to 5G. Uh, maybe the next one is AI. We don't know. But today, I think, um, you know, phones are pretty good. I think uh, we saw some upgrades due to the change in behavior. Like you used to make phone calls like this mm. in the 4G area, texting each other. With the pandemic, people are doing video calls. So people want a better phone for a better camera. But we'll see what the next uh, technology cycle is. A lot of American consumers think it's kind of a two-horse race with Samsung and Apple. But there are other devices out there. What kind of phone do you use? By so the it's way? good. Uh, so right now, I'm actually uh, testing this uh, uh, actually, uh, this Motorola phone, uh, the Think phone, which is uh, kind of designed for an enterprise. It has mm -hmm. a Snapdragon 8 series on it. I have two phones uh, that I switch back and forth. One is this one that I'm trying. The other one is the Samsung Flip 4. Uh, I like this return to mm -hmm. foldable flip Old phones. School. I like that. <laughs> so uh, that's the other one I use. That's great. Um, and you mentioned 5G. Where does that stand? Look, 5G, uh, it continued to be an its way. I think we achieved the midpoint of, uh, of the 5G, I think decade. We think about generation of wireless, they, they go by decades. So the timeline for 6G is for 2030 and, uh, and beyond. So we're just getting to the point that we're gonna go to an upgrade in 5G called 5G Advance. And that's where you have uh, a number of capabilities, uh, increasing performance, increasing latency, and also applications for other industries as well. Um, deployments continue to uh, to grow, and I we're excited about emerging markets now deploying 5G. One thing that we're very excited about is India. India has an ambition to connect 100 million households that don't have internet connectivity using 5G broadband. So it's a it's an interesting growth opportunity and we're looking forward for that to happen. I have to ask you about one of your competitors, which has just gotten to be so high profile, which is NVIDIA. And I, I, I guess I'm curious, do you guys compete against them directly? And and what is their, what are they doing that you can learn from maybe even. Yeah, we don't compete with them directly. I think there are some areas we do, like automotive uh, autonomy, for example. We do compete with them. We're a new entrant into the PC. Um, they provide GPUs for PCs. We provide the whole SOC. Um, so it's not really a direct uh, competitor ordered in automotive. Uh, but look, I think NVIDIA, it's incredible what it accomplished with AI accelerated computing. And I think what we look of what they are doing, and we see that as actually an incredible opportunity for us. As I mentioned to you before, if you look what happens with computing in general, and I'm going to go back to the CPU. Remember IBM CPU started in the mainframe and then eventually became uh, your personal computer. A lot of companies didn't believe that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it becomes a computer in the palm of your hand with your smartphone. I've, if AI growth is gonna go the same way, you know, it's, as I, it's gonna go from the cloud to the computers, to phones, into other devices. So we see this transition at AI, which NVIDIA is helping drive, as actually creating a big market opportunity for us in the space that we operate. Yeah, you mentioned autos, and, and I'd love for you to, to drill down a little bit more into that. What exactly is the opportunity there for Qualcomm? Massive. We're very proud because in a very short period of time, 
we have uh, uh, became like an, a large automotive supplier. We have announced, that was back in September 22nd, 2022, pipeline of contracted uh, over $30 billion. And what's happening, our strategy in auto really worked well. So if you look what's happened with the auto industry today, first, the way we see a car, the car is becoming a connected computer on wheels. Investors ask car companies two questions. Are you electrical and are you digital? And the digital is where we come from. We did create a complete platform as the cars are being designed with electrification and all the changes we create a complete part, uh, uh, platform. Connects the car to the cloud, provide a digital cockpit experience and provide it as an autonomy. We work on virtually every brand and, and across including new players. We had the China Auto Show. Um, it's incredible. We have over 40 OEMs in China that launched 100 cars over the past few years. So it's a digital transformation like we have not seen in any industry. It's a, the industry is changing dramatically, and I think it's a great opportunity for technology. The amount of silicon car is increasing 10x generation after generation. Yeah, I remember the tipping point where they're spending more on electronics than on steel happened a few years back, and that continues to be the case. It is a connected computer on wheels. Love that. And what about the consumer? XR, VR, some would say that's been eclipsed by AI now, but it's still a real thing? Well, AI can help those things uh, as well. It is a real thing. So look, we, we have invested in this for over a decade. We're bullish. We have a great partnership uh, across multiple ecosystems we partner with uh, Meta, we partner with Microsoft, we partner with Google, uh, we partner with a number of other companies. And uh, the way I think about this, Andy, is physical and digital spaces are going to merge. There's, there's a digital twin of everything. So the ability for you to merge a physical world with a digital world, um, it's a huge opportunity. And I think people tend to think about this like, okay, I'm going to use a VR device and I'm going to be immersed in a game. But that's not the only application. I'll give you an example. Something as simple of of a communication use case, like in having a phone call. Um, it is not impossible now from a technology standpoint. We're just going through the technology cost curves and the optics development, but I could have glasses and I will have a holographic uh, conversation with you like you and I are having right now. There's nothing that will prevent this from being rendered right in front of my eyes. So I think that's the opportunity for the long term merger or physical and digital spaces is gonna happen. Final question, Cristiano. You've been CEO for about two years now. Wondering what you think you've accomplished here in that time and then what you need to still do going forward. That's a difficult question. Um, look, one one thing that I, I've been very focused in doing and um, I want I want. I will not declare victory because the job is not done, but it's transformed the company, uh, really um, identify new end markets for our technology and grow and diversify. I think we have uh, an incredible uh, technology portfolio and we are unlocking new channels. I think Alto is an example of that. I think industrial IoT is another example of that. And uh, we're... We're still in the beginning of this mission. Cristiano Amon, CEO of Qualcomm, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Happy talking to you, Andy. You've been watching at Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.